Good Monday morning, everybody. Hello, Leanne Mole. Look at you. Hello. Hello. New glasses? New glasses? Yes, I can see through oh. them. <laughs> the most important thing. That's fantastic. So you, I'm over here. You can see me? <laughs> well done. Yes. Good. Very, but very good. You, them, you know, you, you feel a bit um, seasick when you first get new glasses. Do you? It like takes you a while to settle, settle mm. into it. Okay. Yeah, but I've had a good weekend of uh, getting used to them, so we're all good to go. Excellent. Do you buy those at the same place that Fikilim Balula gets his glasses? Because they look like the, the similar sort of design. <laughs> it's exactly no, really. what I was going for. That's the look that you wanted, huh? Well, it you know, it depends on a lot of things. Firstly, I had to make sure that they weren't metal um, arms because I'm allergic to those. And then allergic? It, yeah, I get all swollen and itchy and scabby and all of that oh behind my, my ears. Oh, my God. Yeah, horrible. Um, mm. And then so that, that limits you in some way. And then... Because they are multifocals, you can't have them too deep at the bottom. Because now I have to read through the bottom. Oh, oh! So when so, you when you go like when you go like that, it's for far. I mean, you go like that, it's for close. Yeah, or more like when I'm facing forward, it's for far, and then you just look through the bottom if you're looking at your phone. It's so now you know. Now you know why why you see your your parents going like this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and like holding your phone far away or trying to, yeah. Yes. It's all of That's that. You know, the, bo the, bo the body still uh, fails us in some ways as hard as we try. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. Uh, there's certainly stuff that, that starts happening. Like I was um, I was talking to my, my brother yesterday. He just moved house. And he's got like this ankle. He had an accident when he was, I don't know, in school. And um, after you've been carrying a lot of heavy stuff, he says it, it's it just there's nothing you can do, right? It's just yeah. going to be sore. And he said the last thing he wants to do is is go to hospital to try and have it fixed and fiddled with, because he reckons you do that, you're just asking for trouble. It's like it's going to get worse, not better. You see, I felt the same way about my hip, um, and I've got a friend who has um, gammy knees, and she feels that way as well. Uh, but the thing is, things have improved gammy so much. Knees. You got gammy yes. knees. <laughs> she has gammy knees, yes. Um, oh man! And she's you she's people. petrified of going in because she thinks, you know, things will only get worse. But after my experience, um, maybe it's just because it's the hip. But uh, I certainly have no regrets. Things have changed a lot. No um, regrets. No regrets. Well, um, for those people who are still a little bit confused, but um, there's stuff happening at the moment. So it's 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 Cliff Central, but it's also the real network, which is just kind of a, a, a rebranding process. So that's going to be over the next couple of weeks so that you don't you don't think suddenly you've been dropped into uh, like a parallel universe where actually everything looks the same, but the name is different. So yeah, if you, if you wondered what happened, like basically we've... <laughs> What Cliff Central's, yeah. Tell us what's happening. Cliff Central's become two different things. It's become, on the one hand, the real network, which will continue to broadcast this show uh, live as it is. Nothing changes. And we will podcast it and everything else the way you're used to it going. And there'll also be new shows available on that platform. And then there will be the podcast party, which is uh, something we launched in the run-up to these elections. Very much involved in you know, content that's uh, political, content that is about critical thinking, um, bringing in especially young people to the process. So they're, they're basically going to be two separate vehicles from here on in. And really, for, for most people, it won't ma make a difference. Mm. It won't even matter that much. But for, you know, anybody who's like paying attention to the detail, I need to just clear that up so nobody feels that we've left them out, you know. Yeah. Got it. Everybody, yes. everybody must... Uh, Oh, it's not complicated, it really, and I don't want to spend too much time worrying about it. Um, it's going to make very little difference to most of us. 
Um, and for those who do, it's going to provide all kinds of opportunities that we didn't have before to sell shows, to create really, really interesting content, to be able to um, make, I think, for, for brands and for advertisers to give them something that they can, uh, they can, they can actually get involved in, which is very cool. And I think that's going to be uh, an exciting new development. You know, things have been uh, building up to this. We're turning, well, Cliff Central would be turning 10 at the end of May or at the end of mm. April. It's only a month away. And uh, this year is already flying. I mean, yesterday I was complaining about how hot it was this weekend, and it really was. And then we suddenly had that monster hailstorm yesterday. Did you have that where you are? Yeah, it came in, in bouts. You know, there were... It, it was about three or four different storms lined up. Yeah. Every time you thought it was ending, a new one began. And what I was trying hell? to. <laughs> what were those I old was... people? Who were those old people? That's for a story I have to tell you later. Oh. I just saw <laughs> these old people. I'm like, what the hell? Is that Leanne's weekend? <laughs> <laughs> it's me and my new boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> on our first date. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes. So, I, yeah, I was trying to order um, food to be delivered. Mm -hmm. And because of the the weather, um, all the deliveries had stopped. Uh, so, did you guess, did you starve? Yeah, I had about 12 almonds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ah. had my eyes set on something like really delicious, some Indian or something. Yes. Um, um, and then I ended up having about 12 almonds, 12 and a half there were left. Bam, that was your supper. Yeah, well, probably more nutritious than what I was going to order. Yeah, Snipe says that was one hell of a storm. Listen, uh, that, that, hail, that hail came down, and I haven't seen a hailstorm like that for a while, so it was kind of unexpected, you know. Um, there were... All the dogs were, were like rolling around in it. They love hail. Yeah. I think it feels I, weird. My, my, my dog had the best weekend of her life this weekend. She did all the things that a dog could do. So she was busy with uh, the hail yesterday, but she also went on a dog walk. You'll like this, Leanne. She was, yeah. she was, raising, she was raising money for the poor dogs. So oh, she really? Was, uh, yeah, she did, a, she did a little dog walk for charity. and. You know, there was uh, an oh, animal clinic Alice. in the area. Yeah, I know. She was being very philanthropic. She felt very full of herself after that. And and I think um, I think she enjoyed it. I mean, there were all these other dogs. Uh, I didn't because I, you know how much I love uh, leaving the house, right? But mm -hmm. she had a lot of fun. She was kind of um, making friends with huskies and beagles and everybody else. And she did, uh, I don't know, maybe about a third of it. And then I could see that she, she was not so keen anymore. Neither was I. I was like, good, get the hell out of here. Anyway. Uh, well, okay. that's very good. I, I mean, she is royalty and all. So, you know, wow. she, she has to give to the poor every now and then. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I sold it to her. I'm like, you know what? You, you, it can't just be you uh, being the spoiled dog and, and you know, you you get uh, and she really is like she doesn't spend time on her own because god forbid she should be alone you know she she has to yeah. be looked after all the time and um she gets uh, she gets treated pretty damn well people like her she's she's cute she's a good looking dog so mm. i think she gets uh, she gets special and preferential treatment a lot of the time um let me show you a picture here quickly show you what she got up to alice having her little walk she was um when we arrived there the uh the, the organizers had, had made something called a puppuccino have you ever heard of this yes it's like just mm -hmm. the frothy milk stuff yeah so they it's like whipped cream with a dog biscuit in it oh that's right now yeah, take a look there she is oh getting ready for a little walk oh and, he's uh, so cute yeah, I'm embarrassed to say that we we kind of skived off and and disappeared eventually. I was like, nah, this is boring. Let's go. But she did, you know, we paid our money and therefore she she helped a good cause. She made an appearance. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was that was her it was her best weekend ever. Lots of fun, lots of uh, exciting new things. And I suppose yeah. uh for for 
anybody who is you know interested in politics, it was a big weekend too because we had all the party Ooh. lists come out. So people are talking about that as well. P Proper Agenda says, great weekend, seven days of no water in Linden, Blairgowrie, et cetera. Oh, man, yeah. I'm sorry. Jesus. Yeah, that's not Melville too. In fact, it's been longer for Melville. Um, yeah. I th and I think we've had, where I am, I've had 10 days of low water pressure and then zero water the whole of yesterday. So I, oh. I was uh, driving around, finding places, knocking on doors. <laughs> Please, can I wash my bits? Oh, <laughs> no. With my towel in hand. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I had to do that late last night. Um, I wonder. If, so I wonder if people uh, sign up for gym memberships when the water's off because they suddenly realize, okay, well, I can shower there. A hundred percent. Definitely right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. SM says we had major flooding in Dubai this weekend. Cloud mm. seeding. Hmm. Uh, uh, listen, the weather is bizarre. Uh, so I'm the Doctor Phil of South Africa. Your Doctor Phil launched his own channel. Um, I don't think you can call me the Dr. Phil, but we've got Dr. Hanan on just now. He's like our Dr. Phil, right? Mm -hmm. yeah? Well, he's, he's a lot more, um, uh, I think, qualified than Dr. Phil is, to be honest. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> Phil's not a real doctor. <laughs> well, some would argue. Um, I, I like Dr. Phil. I always I take the piss out of him because, well, well, you gotta, you gotta sort yourself out here. You, you don't want to be treating your daughter like that. Meanwhile, he's actually like one of the few sensible voices in America when it comes to like how to raise kids and, you know, how to deal with family stuff and, and all the drama <laughs> and psychological yeah. disorders. And, you know what the guy's he's, like. He's I like in Dr. the land Phil. of, in the land of the blind. You know, with him. Um, and at least he can get through to some people because they do respect him. But where the respect is, is lost is often the people who've been on his show who then reveal all or tell all after they've been on. Um, and their He's stories. Been no, even worse. So, um, you know, his producers will go and find these people in various parts of America. Um, let's say it's an alcoholic that they found who's desperate yeah. to stop drinking. Um, and they'll go through all the processes. They'll sign all these documents. Then they'll fly them over the night before the show and put them yeah. up in a hotel room. But they'll leave a, a whole, the liquor the liquor fridge full. And so? to almost to, in, to ensure that these people end up pissed on the show the next day. Yeah. Okay. So, Leanne, so they, they I've plant been... they plant things so that the show becomes more entertaining. Of course, but that's what a producer does. That's why we send you a bottle of booze every morning before the show, and James makes sure that you get it before the show starts. <laughs> so uh, um, there are all these things about how he he manipulates people into oh come on listen things before the show. It's a, it's a TV show. There, there is no reason that you should be sharing your psychologist's appointment with the rest of America. Of course, it's a TV show. Of course, there's an entertainment element built into it. We're not that naive. And by the way, have you ever been to a hotel where they didn't give you the, the bar fridge? Oh, 100%. Especially if it's a corporate oh. thing or a work thing, they, um, they probably won't and you have to select it. But apparently they planted ex extra vodka in the car and all, all these stories. Well, because these are hicks. He picks them up from the middle of like nowhere, Shitsville, Arkansas, and he flies them to LA. And and do you think he want to keep he wants to keep them there for more than one night? Absolutely not. It costs a lot of money. And you bring these people in, they tell you their 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 miserable life story. He gets to put it on TV, good for ratings, and he gets to um Tell them where they where they where they went wrong. It's good. That's TV. Hmm. What did you think it was? You think when we used to have singers on idols, we would <clears throat> make sure that they were stable people all the time? I mean, some of them would pitch up with uh, G strings on. You know what? What? No, I mean, what are you going to do? People are. They. It, this is. It's not to say that it isn't true. All the stuff yeah. that you said about Doctor Phil, maybe. Maybe they did make it a little bit easier for people to behave stupidly and embarrass themselves. Guarantee you they did the same with the Jerry Springer show. I guarantee they did the same with Oprah. 
For heaven's sake, Oprah launched Dr. Phil, remember? There's there's a show, Love is Blind. Have you heard of it? It's in season yeah. six now. This is the one where um, you only get to see the person that you fall in love with, like in the last episode or whatever? No, no, that's Married at First Sight. That's more oh, like that. I, Love is Blind, yeah. you, you, you get to meet each other through these pods, separate pods, so yeah. you can't see each other. And okay. uh, that's for about two weeks or whatever it is, not even. Um, and you, you date, I think it's like 15 males and 15 females, and you date everyone. Um, and you actually end up making a proposal through this wall. You can't even see the person that you've now fallen in love with over the last few days. You propose to marry and then you see each other. Then you, then you go to like um, Mexico or to the D Dominican Republic or whatever, and you, yeah. you go and have this like two-week honeymoon and then you, you actually get married if it gets that far. But that's at its peak at the moment because the show has concluded and now it's time for the reunion show, which airs on Wednesday, I think. And everyone's mm -hmm. going crazy about it. So for that, you have to go through serious psychometric tests and, and all of that sort of thing. But I swear the channel finds people who are just on the border. <laughs> well, <of laughs> who are like just slightly cleared but are going to create drama. And how many of these people yeah. are already engaged or already in relationships and they come on the show and they propose? It's crazy. Of course. It's absolutely Look, hilarious. I mean, you, you've got to realize this. And for people who don't know this by now, it's like people who still think that uh, that, that, that TV wrestling stuff is real. Uh, it's not. <clears throat> I hate to break it to you guys, but like a lot of TV is made for you to mindlessly absorb and entertain yourself and it seems you know like soap operas are still the most popular thing in south african television you know why because some people think it's real <laughs> and, and the same goes for all these reality shows they're not reality shows you think that those real housewives you think they sit there and and this is how it actually goes down you think that they're blissfully unaware of the cameras they're all acting up the producer yeah. says Hey, did you hear this? This one said something really bitchy about you. The other one goes, Oh, I can't believe it. He's like, Save that reaction until we hit roll. And then they, you know, lights, camera, action. And then suddenly, Did you call me that, you bitch? And then they start <laughs> fighting with each other. What do you think? It's all, um, it, it's just it happens. It, they're lucky enough to have the cameras rolling at the right time, or they've got them on 24 7, and they, they've got some poor editor who has to go and find the best parts. No, it's all set up. Come on. Uh, did you see um, Sharon Osbourne, as Azempic Sharon as she is now, or Azempic no. Osbourne? Um, she's on Big Brother at the moment, so she's oh. stuck in a house in a house somewhere. Um, why would Why would Sharon Osbourne do that? I mean, I have no I mean, idea. She really doesn't need to. No, I love Sharon Osbourne. I mean, yeah. I think that. She uh, she's definitely had a little bit too much work done, in my opinion, but I've always found her entertaining. I always think that she's very upfront, honest, mm, straightforward. Very real, yeah. Yeah, and she's, uh, for whatever reason, she put her family on TV a long time ago, so maybe she's just got a major thing for TV and, and whatever. I mean, the Kardashians do as well, right? And it's worked for them. It's worked for the Osbournes, worked for the Kardashians. But I think... You know, here's Sharon. She's had a good career. She's a tremendously successful woman, married to Ozzy Osbourne. She was his manager for a very long time. She's an impressive woman. But I have to ask, why would she want to be on this show? Why would she want to be on Big Brother? It's like such a step down for her. Um, she doesn't need the, she doesn't need the attention. She doesn't need the money. She's seventy one years old. This lady. Come on, Sharon, what, what's this all about? Who are you trying to impress? Yeah, I don't understand. And she's in there with one of the other co-hosts from the show that Simon Cowell does. Um, mm. the, the guy with gray hair. Louis Walsh. And that's it, yeah. And the, the, two, the uh, footage has apparently um, now been pulled because, well, they had to do something, I'm not quite sure, where they... Um, they stopped the live feed or something because mm -hmm. her and Louis Walsh were bad mouthing other celebrities. 
But I mean, if you know Sharon, you know she's just telling the truth. <laughs> I, I love her. What, so who did she go after? She went after James Corden. <laughs> um, oh, I hate him. Good. <laughs> yeah, she went after him. She went after Anna Wintour, calling her the C word. <laughs> <laughs> that's great this is, this is just these two old people lying on like bean bags or whatever talking about people that they've met before um great. and ellen, De ellen degeneres came up oh, and and they she, all said, oh she said she makes me want to vomit <laughs> <laughs> all right well listen god bless you sharon i mean this is her entertaining the rest of us right but yeah i I'm I really don't get why she would do it, but since she's on there, that's great. Um, I, I heard a little bit about this because, you know, I'm I'm back on Twitter now, and I was checking out my feed, and one of the oh, things yeah. that came up is this clip of Sharon Osbourne saying, "Oh, James Corden is like the biggest name dropper in the world. Yes. He's so all he does is he drops names like stones everywhere he goes." She said, "I can't stand him." I thought, "Wow, okay, she's really." tearing him a new but i couldn't figure out where it was from now you've explained it to me now i understand yes so it's all but happening I can, I can imagine james corden is a big name dropper in fact i've got the other person who i've always thought was a terrible name dropper and he is his whole book i had to review this book of his once and mm -hmm. it was basically just him name dropping from beginning to end uh, it's over here Oh, there it is. Piers Morgan. Uh, the, book is called, the book is called God Bless America. All he does in this book is just drop names. It's mm -hmm. like I met this one, and then I was with this one, then I was invited to party with this one, and I know this book. It's just so boring. And you can see, like, it was, it was Oscar weekend, right? So they had the Oscars this weekend. Somebody said that uh, in the comments that apparently Al Pacino did mm. one of the Oscar awards, but he screwed it up completely. Like Al oh, Pacino yeah. went on, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he announced the winner before he'd even said who the nominees were. <laughs> yeah, Carl. <laughs> Thanks for that, Carl. So he says Hollywood have lost their minds because it's a whole bunch of old people. But I'm not surprised. And they had Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, Kimmel. Had Kimmel on uh, hosting it. Apparently, it was all just so lame. Just mm. lame. I, I, I'm really not is. surprised. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have watched the Oscars. So thank you, Carl, for giving us that bit of info, because otherwise we wouldn't have known anything about the Oscars this morning. So I, I actually did read up on it this morning. It came up as a BBC alert. I was like, are you really alerting me to this? But anyway, so Oppenheimer uh, was the biggest winner. They got mm -hmm. seven awards including Best Picture and Best Actor for Killian Murphy. Um, right. Also Love won best, best Supporting Actor for Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. Best Director for Christopher Nolan, plus Film Editing, Cinematography, and Original Score. Then, I'm guessing, uh, guessing that, yeah. that, um, you know, that Oppenheimer was, uh, was a crowd favorite. I, I would have said that that would have won the awards anyway. Mm. Well, I mean, they had 13 nominations. Yeah, not bad. Emma Stone won Best Actress for her role in Poor Things, which also won Best Production Design, Makeup and Costume Design. Hmm. Um, Best Supporting Actress went to The Holdovers star, Davine Joy Randolph. Um, Barbie, which was last year's highest grossing film, received just one award, and it was just for the song by... Uh, yeah, but are you surprised? Uh, yeah, your brother. What are we? Are we going to give it an award just because uh, it, it 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 was there and it grossed a lot of money? They never give the best grossing movies all the all the awards, do they? They never do. No, no. I think the the way the journalist has written the story on the BBC is just he's filled in, or they have filled in information by saying, by the way, it was last year's highest grossing film. I think there was mm. a lot of build up and the awards before. Before the Oscars, Barbie did really well. So I just think it's probably a little bit of a surprise that they didn't receive as many awards. Marpello says it's really bad on The Real Housewives. Most people believe all that stuff is real. I figure it out very early. 
There's no way grown adults would behave like that. Well, you'd be surprised, but yes. I and mean, that's why they that's why they choose those people. It's a casting process. It's not a it's not a reality show that you know they 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 obviously take submissions from people who are attention seekers and then they cast them on the show. I mean, this is why Sharon Osborne's such a coup, because she does run her mouth about everybody. And I think it's about time. I think, you know, people like Anna Winter, who's been at the top of the fashion world for I don't know, 100 years, however long that crypt keeping woman has been there. I mean, she's, mm. you know, she's definitely hugely influential and she's very powerful in the fashion world, but she seems like she's a total pain in the ass. And for Sharon to say that is excellent because why should Hollywood keep this, this, um, like this veneer where everybody, you know, who, who watches the, the rest of us, us normal people, where we can't criticize them and they all protect each other. I like the fact that Sharon's out there saying horrible things about uh, Anna Winter and James Corden. Somebody said here in the comments, it's uh, Carl. He says, James Corden must be one of the most insufferable people in Hollywood. And then Robert says, Alan, I suppose you mean Alan Ford. He also loves name dropping. Oh my God, yes. No, no, he's a big name dropper <laughs> on this show. You just bring Alan on here. Oh, you know, I was talking to my friend Naomi Campbell the other day. I'm like, oh, for <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, you get people like that, and they're they're they generally their perfect job description would be like something like eventing or PR, mm -hmm. um, where they kind of remember. I mean, you and I have met so many people throughout the years that we could name drop, um, but the thing is, I don't even remember half of them because we don't place such high mm -hmm. importance on that. Whereas there are some people who, for them, it's absolutely everything in their lives. I hope I don't name drop because, yeah, I, I mean, I've met lots of cool people, but it's it, there's something really, ugh, something exhausting about people who just want you to know that they know famous people or rich people or important people. Um, I I really try hard not to do that because to me, someone is either the kind of person you want to spend more time with or less time with, and it really doesn't have much to do with their job, mm. or or their fame, or their wealth. They're just, there's some people that you just love to spend time with. Am I right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, somebody says here, Masters of the Air, joking atheist says, Masters of the Air is going to grab all the awards for a series. Mark my words. I've heard such good things about this. Um, my brother was actually telling my dad. That, is it a pilot thing? So I think it's about World War II. Um, mm. And and the people used to fly those missions uh, in World War II. I'm not 100% sure because I haven't seen it yet, but I believe it's brilliant. So yes, Slippery Pickle or Joking Atheist. Too. It's Joking Atheist. Uh, yeah, you're right. Very good. Very, very good from what I've heard. So um, we've got to quickly pay a little bit of attention to the politics over the weekend, and we've also got to get some sport in, which we'll do in a second. But apparently... Uh, they've they've all released their lists. So I mm -hmm. saw it was it was so easy. Supposedly, um, we weren't meant to see this list. The ANC is complaining that the list was leaked from uh, the IEC. But oh. I think once the IEC receives the lists, it is their job to share it with us. We we, we shouldn't have secrets, right? I mean, these are political parties who are vying for your vote. You should know who's on their list because those are the people that are going to get the jobs if they get enough seats in mm. both parliament. You know, if they get into the executive, then there'll be placements there and in, in provincial legislatures, uh, local. That's why we need these lists. So within probably a space of, I don't know, half an hour on Saturday morning, I woke up and I suddenly had seen MK's list, the ANC's list, and the EFF's list. Um, I couldn't find any of the others, and I don't think anyone's all that interested in the others because everybody's everybody's really interested in this MK party. And I saw some research that someone had published yesterday, uh, the Brenthurst Foundation had published, about the MK party and how they may just be the biggest party in KZN. They might even be bigger than the ANC. Of course, if the DA and the IFP throw in together in the multi-party charter, they might have more. But um, it's quite a thing. You know, these lists matter because the people on them will become the people we end up uh, 
having an important position. So mm. Jacob Zuma is at the top of the MK list. Julius Malema is at the top of the EFF list. And Cyril uh, Matamela Ramaphosa is at number one on the ANC's list. So we have to see what happens. But I did notice something really funny. Uh, Carl Niehaus, who everyone in South Africa hates, everyone, even the EFF, who he's joined. Um, he's number 187 or something on the EFF's on the list. <laughs> so oh, he's basically, no. he's, he's sold his soul to be number 187. Yeah. Really? What a, what he an demoted, absolute. Demoted himself. What a loser. So if anybody was really curious about where Carl Niehaus fits in, he's number, <laughs> number 187 or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You think, oh, well, I'm finally going to leave the ANC because they've, they've basically thrown him out. They've said, you're a disgrace and embarrassment. And let me tell you, for the ANC to throw someone out and say you're a disgrace and embarrassment, that's a hell of a thing because they'll take anyone. And, and then he, he joins the EFF and he's like standing out there with a loud hailer and a red beret on. And he looks like he's helping them out with all their election uh, campaigning. And people are like, oh, well, you know, Carl Niehaus, he's obviously going to be important in the in the EFF. <laughs> Turns out, no. Turns out he's not important at all. Oh, dear. But I think number two on the EFF list is uh, Floyd, Floyd Shivambu. Number three is Dalim Porfu. Uh, number four is uh, somebody else. Then there's Godrich Gardi. Then there's um, Buisen Intlozi. So it's, it's kind of who you expected on the EFF's list. Uh, yeah. The ANC is also pretty much who you'd expect. I did see, though, that a lot of those those heavyweight, if you'll pardon the pun, ANC women, like you've got Tandi Mudise and you've got um, Naleli Pandor and all of those people, they're right down in the 80s. They're not like up near the top, which is, I think, quite interesting. Number two is Paul Mashatile on the ANC, uh, ANC's list. Um no real surprises, though, it's got to be said. Mm. You know, it's not like there's suddenly someone at number five and you're like, who's this? I've never heard of this person. Um, a lot of those names I wouldn't know off the back of my hand, you know? Yeah. And uh, we're still waiting for, for the other smaller parties. So if you know anything that we don't know, I'd love to hear about it. Um, imagine how crap the EFF's candidate number 189 must be. Unless the list stops at one eight nine, says Tracy. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, John. That the, that there are there EFF was... all over the North Coast, and not many others. Yeah, they've obviously got some funding from somewhere. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting because uh, you used to only see EFF posters on the outskirts of the CBD, not the CBD, but the urban areas. Mm -hmm. You would see them going out onto. Um, almost where you were reaching other provinces or where there are big swathes of land with nothing much else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you're seeing them sort of in Santon City. Um, right. But uh, what was interesting as well is there was a, a, a party in Cape Town. I can't, I don't know what they were called, uh, the Western Cape, and they claimed to have 58% interest um, and and supporters. But apparently they weren't even able to make it on the list. They didn't even get 200 signatures. So somebody's been well, making false claims. Well, people were saying that um, Musi Maimane was going to quit. That was that uh, press conference that Pumi tipped us off about on Thursday. But it, it turns out, no, Bosa are very much in. That's his building one, South Africa. And, um, and Musi's happy to go in and he's, uh, he's got the signatures. So he's definitely in. All right, let's turn our attention to some sport. Uh, we've got producer James standing by. Good morning, producer James. How are you? You don't have sound. You need to unmute yourself. I'm getting there. Can you hear me now? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you, I, I mean, uh, you're on. You're on. You're on. All right. Fine. Okay. Um, All good. Yeah, well, uh, you, it's still, I mean, it's an embarrassing thing to have to unmute yourself when you're the producer. <laughs> okay, so let's turn our attention to a little bit of sport this Monday morning, because what we do on a Friday is Ben gives us a little rundown of what we can look forward to. 
And then on a Monday, we get to check out the results of what we did watch over the weekend. And maybe if you missed some of this, this will be news to you. So let's get to it. Beyond the Scoreboard, brought to you by Superbets. What do you got for us, Producer James? Right. So we're going to start in the world of rugby, Six Nations, some massive upsets. Um, Italy beat Scotland 31-29. Uh, right. which is absolutely crazy. That kicked off the weekend of the underdogs um, in the Six Nations. Then England took on Ireland, uh, 23-22 there. Uh, what happened in that game was quite crazy. Uh, there was a last-second drop goal by Marcus Smith, um, which would see that drop goal uh, stopping Ireland from going back-to-back -back in uh, this championship, which, again, just crazy. Um, and then Wales, France, Wales, 24, France, 45. Um, quite a scoreline there. Uh, the French mm -hmm. played incredibly well for that result. And I mean, the scoreline obviously shows that one. Um, on to the world of football. And as you can see, I'm wearing a Liverpool shirt today. Um, yes. I wish I was wearing it under better circumstances. Um, oh, today, sorry. we're just, it's just a, a string of support is what we're doing today. Um, mm. Liverpool drew 1-1 one, one with City. Um, as a Liverpool fan, I feel like my team was robbed. Um, many other people will say differently. Uh, Wait, we say, deserve... it for, say it for us in a Scouse accent. Go, we was robbed. <laughs> I, do you know, I've actually been working on my Scouse accent and I still can't uh, do it. I can say a couple you. of names like Jordan. Um, that's how they say Jordan <laughs> in Liverpool, which is crazy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, Liverpool Bad City 1-1 uh, like I said Reds robbed um, in my opinion that's just how I feel as a Liverpool fan um, speaking of the Premier League it's heating up uh, I do have to tell you guys that this is getting incredibly tight with about 10 games to go Arsenal uh, went top of the log this weekend on 64 points after Liverpool's game they're also on 64 points and in mm -hmm. third place on the log is Manchester City on 62 so the top three, three Top three teams, 10 games to go. It's getting quite intense. Um, Arsenal having won this weekend 2-1. Um, and Spurs having beat Villa 4-0 uh, with a goal from Son, of course. The guy always scores. Um, mm -hmm. Then moving on to local football, PSL Pirates played Chiefs in the Soweto derby. There was a double brace in that game from both teams. Um, Monopule Saleng and Ashley Dupreez were both the goal scorers there. Um, and then Sundowns beat Chippy United to go 12 points clear ahead of Pirates on the log. Um, and just to put that into context for uh, people that aren't heavy into sports, the AFCON was not so long ago, and most of the Bufana squad were players from the Sundowns setup. Sundowns are still 12 points clear on top of the log in uh, the PSL, which is, which is just crazy. Um, Moving on to cricket, India versus England, fifth test, India won by an innings and 64 runs. Kaldeep Yadav taking five for 72. Um, also taking player of the match, um, as well as Ravishandran Ashwin taking four for 51. Um, and then lastly, the Formula One, the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. I also have a Red Bull shirt, probably should have worn that today. Yeah. Uh, Red Bull then at went least you'd have some, some, some victory on your side. <laughs> Uh, Red Bull went one and two, which was also absolutely insane. Um, and then, of course, Slippery Pickle reminding me he, uh, the UFC happened this weekend. Uh, Francis Ngannou, Anthony Joshua, wow, what a knockout. Uh, but that was just one of the wildest knockouts I've ever seen in my life. Um, and what an end to a fight. Uh, and that's your sports wrap on this Monday morning. And, Very good. And before everyone loses their, their shit in the comments, Brad Binder, MotoGP, came second. Uh, wow. Very good. I did miss that one. I'm not going to lie, but that's actually very impressive. Good for yeah, the guy. Yeah. Good for the guy. Apparently, his um, um, bike is souped up and all done up oh, for wow. this year. Yeah, apparently, it's a step up. So, if I, people are expecting him to do well. I should have done research. I am also hearing that he's pipped to maybe win the championship this year. I could be wrong. I'm just double checking right now, uh, but he is a South African doing well overseas, which is obviously great for us. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, an excellent job there, James. Nice to you. have you on this morning to help us out Thank with you. the sport. And if you want to find out more sports results, you can obviously get them all on uh, cliffcentral.com. Plus we will post all the important stuff that you need to know 
in the show notes. And by the way, uh, if you haven't already, super bets is worth having a go at because as Ben told us on Friday, you could bet on any of these and you'll find uh, the odds. And if you bet correctly and if you if you are able to um, to use the multipliers, like he said, you could win some serious money. But of course, they support responsible gambling. So strictly no under 18s, winners know when to stop. The South African Responsible Gambling Foundation's toll-free counseling hotline, 0800-006-008. But go and have a go if you haven't already. Thank you, James. No worries. Good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Good. And uh, still to come, Dr. Hanan. Uh, we were talking about Dr. Phil earlier. We'll speak to our own Dr. Phil in just a short while. He's, of course, a renowned psychologist, head of the Anxiety and Trauma Clinic in Johannesburg. And we're going to talk about how to avoid stupid conflicts on social media with strangers. I mean, it's something everybody, mm. everybody gets into. Yeah. And I think WhatsApp can easily fall into that category as well, especially your exactly. neighborhood groups. Oh, man, the worst. <laughs> By the way, so are you meant to, when you, when you move, like my brother did over the weekend, are you meant to leave the group yourself or does someone throw you out? No, no one generally throws anyone out. You need to leave. But uh, for instance, um, I haven't sold this property that I've left. It's been two mm -hmm. years now. So I'm still on the, on the groups because I'm, a, I'm a, a resident. So I need to know what's happening, you know, in terms of water, electricity, sure. crime. Um, and that, that area, the, in order for, for that house, I've got to be on three separate groups. And then uh -oh. I'm on one, one of my own now. So I have all these groups muted, and then every now and then I check in. But it's mm -hmm. it's funny to see the later at night that it gets, uh, mm -hmm. people are more abusive. And Abus but are they straight up abusive? I mean, do they start like having a go at each other? Is there is there like aggression? What are you talking about, abuse? Yeah, absolutely. There's there there uh, there's racial tension, um, all sorts of things. Wow. And I, I think especially in 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 the suburb that I'm talking about, because they've been battling for years now with, with water and electricity in a bad way, you know, beyond load shedding, there are other problems. Um, and uh, I think when people are like, when they haven't had a shower and they come home, there's no water, mm -hmm. there's no electricity, tensions run high. Absolutely. Not in a good mood. Yeah. It's funny. It's the same with the economy. You know, if there's if there's growth and the economy is getting better and people have opportunities and everybody's making a little bit more, then everybody gets along like a house on fire. But as soon as the the, the tables turn and people are, are, are feeling financial pressure, they just that's when they lash out at each other. And you can see it. It's people. We were talking about this just last week. Uh, there's there's a bit of tension in the air. You know, people are. They, they're on tenterhooks for these elections, and, and that's why we were talking about the party lists earlier. It seems everybody is, uh, is thinking about this stuff and talking about it. It's, it's definitely on our minds, even if it's background noise a lot of the time. We are, we're primed for <clears throat> losing our minds and, and being on, on edge, being mm. ready to fight each other at any given time. So I think it's apposite then that we talk to Dr. Hanan about this in a short while. There are some yeah. other things uh, that I want us to talk about. And by the way, if you've got any issues that you want to talk to Dr. Hanan about uh, and you, you want to you know, help other people, because that's essentially what you can do here. If you come on, let's say you've got some kind of problem that you want to discuss. You're having a fight with a work colleague, uh, someone in the family. You're busy trying to keep your marriage together, whatever it is. You come on and you do that here on the show with us, and we can keep you anonymous if you if you'd prefer that. Um, but what it does is it helps other people. Because maybe they're not as brave as you, and they're going through exactly the same thing, and then they can hear the advice that uh, Dr. Hanan gives you, and they might be able to help someone else. That's the whole idea. Uh, election corruption is the first and foremost thing that's on my mind for 2024, says Joking Atheist. Well, I, I felt that way too. I was also kind of worried about that. And we've had two episodes of Democracy 101 with the IEC, and having met the people at the IEC who are doing the work behind the scenes, the actual guys in charge, I'm feeling very confident. I thought that mm. they were all very impressive people. They definitely know what they're doing. They answered all of our questions. 
and you know it's it's less down to the personality of the people but you can you can always you can smell competence right and in a country like ours where so many people are in positions because of politics it feels yeah. to me like the, the IEC have got some properly like competent people in there um i'm certainly feeling a lot more confident sure. about that since i saw them so i hear you joking atheist and you're right to be a little bit cynical and suspicious um around the elections but i have to say like i'm feeling a lot better about things since we've spoken to them and if you if you don't believe me go and listen to the the show with um last week we did the iec and then i think it was about four weeks ago before that um we also spoke to two guys who are actually in charge of election operations and they really know their stuff so go and take a look don't take my word for it listen to them yourself and you make up your mind it'll it'll put your it'll put your mind at ease a little bit um about what kind of people we've got in charge of the election process and why it should be free and fair. Okay, um, it is Monday. Let's get to Dr. Hanan. Let's see what he can do to help us make our way in a more positive and optimistic fashion towards the start of a new week. How are you, Doc? I'm doing well. How's your weekend, guys? Very good. Do you, um, do you take weekends off or are you seeing uh, crazies over the weekend as well? Saturdays, I do work. Um... Um, till till the late afternoon, but some days I take off. Sure, so it's a six day week for you, hey? Six day. Listen, depression doesn't have a break. Depression doesn't Ooh. have a, a a weekend. So try right, so as we much were, fat as I can. We were we were joking um, about how Doctor Phil has now got his own channel. He's launched this this whole network effectively, and that got us onto talking about him and. You know these TV doctors in general, and how much of it is just made up for for shock and horror and to entertain an audience. But it it does lead us to this discussion that I know you've got some stuff to say about today, and that is this this idea that people are fighting. They're fighting online. They're fighting in 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 person. Uh, Doctor Phil made a big play on Bill Maher's show about how he refuses to be pulled into politics. Um, he says he's not a political guy. And then Bill Maher said to him, but you are, you, you know, the minute you talk about cultural issues, it's bound to be political. And Dr. Phil was like, no, 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 because I talk about cultural issues and those happen to sometimes lead to politics, doesn't mean I'm choosing to talk about politics. It's just that culture comes before politics. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But when you're online uh, and people are tense in South Africa at the moment, I think they're tense in the world. You know, we've got conflict in Russia and Ukraine. We've got conflict in the Middle East. We've got massive financial pressures on people. The cost of living crisis in Europe, America's uh, huge deficit and, and, and inflation problems. People are tense, Doc, and then they go onto social media and they vent. So um, people do find this kind of uh, public square on social media as in the in the format of social media to go out and not just give their peace but become a part of something that makes them feel a sense of belonging my tribe so there are two reasons why many people go online and spew and ingest venom one is because i want to see that i'm not the only one um, that feels the same way i have my tribe and two the the fact that other people arguing makes my life seem a little bit better. So when I see other people struggling, suffering, having and being less than me, then it kind of elevates my position and I feel better about my life. How many times have we spoken to anybody, uh, whether it's a close friend or a distant friend, and uh, we see that their lives are maybe much worse than us, which makes us look at our marriage and makes us look at our sense of purpose and our financial security or insecurity and in comparison feel much better we live our lives through comparisons that's the way it works mm -hmm. we cannot get away from it you know so the whole notion of don't compare yourself to others it's nice in theory but in reality we are going to because that is in the contrast we find meaning that is human nature and that's human psychology you don't have control over whether you want to compare yourself to others you have control of who you compare yourself to so you've got to be very clever in terms of and very bright in terms of who you compare yourself to, but you're going to compare. 
So yeah, the whole the whole we are gonna get onto social media. We are gonna see other people arguing. We are gonna see our tribe go against somebody else's tribe. But you just gotta be very cognizant of what you ingest because you could be ingesting things that actually make you feel worse. Yeah. Um. Leanne and I were talking just now about how how some people go on there and they they really just go on to fight with other people. I mean, even these neighborhood WhatsApp groups, right? And it, people are sometimes looking for a fight because fighting is their is their way of feeling noticed their way of of getting attention um it could quite easily be love as well and i know one of the things we've talked about here is these people who get scammed online because they're so desperate for love but they go online and someone says oh i love you i'm gonna i'm gonna come and fly to see you but you first got to send me a hundred thousand rand and they do because they're lonely. They're lonely. And social media has opened up avenues for people to express themselves that were not there before. And frankly, were, were socially unacceptable before. You couldn't just go and stand in the street and scream, I'm lonely. Somebody pay attention to me because you'd be put in the nut house. Now, of course, yeah. you can do that online in, in other words. And nothing happens to you. There's no cost. But, you know, what I see as a big issue is that we think that we just almost like inject ourselves with bravery the moment we go on social media because we are behind a screen. We are behind this uh, illusion. We are protected by a glass wall. And, you know, it's like somebody picking their nose in the car because they think nobody can see them. Or we feel we feel that we can pull a zap sign at somebody in our car because we are protected by this metal cage. Um, mm -hmm. so we have become a lot braver the moment we are contained around something. And the moment we are behind a computer screen, we feel protected. We feel a little bit more brave. The truth is, Gareth, I mean, you would be the perfect subject. How many people say X, Y, and Z about you behind the screen, but when you meet them in real life, I'm assuming it's a completely different opposite game. I'm sure you receive a lot of love in real life. I'm sure you, you, see a lot of people appreciate what you say but behind the screen people find this kind of uh, yeah. sense of uh, <laughs> arrogance and they feel that they can say whatever they want because it's anonymous and they're not really dealing with a real person i mean do you find that in real life versus the screen well the funny thing is that you know i'll, I'll be called all kinds of things by anonymous people online and i've never ever met anyone there's never been anyone who's come up to me in public and said oh, you're a son of a bitch, or I hate you, or whatever. You might be someone who's drunk sometimes, and they'll feel a little bit uh, confident, and then they'll come <laughs> over and say, I really disagreed with something you said back in 2008. And I'll be like, who even remembers that stuff? Sure. But most people, um, you know, 90 out of 100 people will be friendly as hell and, and, and really, really cool and very nice and fun to talk to, and most of them have something interesting to say. So yeah, it's 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 a totally different. And listen, I don't want us to go down the road that we've gone down before of separating out the virtual from the real life person. I'm interested in what you said just now about comparing yourself, because for most people, that is a big source of consternation and unhappiness. Who should you be comparing yourself to when you when you're online or in real life? So it's a really nuanced and complex, uh, well, it's a simple question, but a really nuanced answer. The truth is you should be assessing what you want to achieve in life. Um, how many times do I say we need to be guided by our goals, not by our feelings? So when I ask 100 people, what do you want? Uh, 99 will not know, or 99 out of 100 will just give you a very general answer. I want to be happy. I want to be yeah. successful. I want to be you know, in a companionship. But those are airy fairy answers that just don't really serve the journey. Because if you give a very general answer, what are you aiming towards? It's like saying, I want to reach for the stars. Well, which one? So you've got to be very specific in terms of what you want out of life. And the reason why people don't want to set goals is because one of the reasons is because they fear failure. They feel they feel that they might miss the mark. So they'd rather set very general goals so, for example, mm -hmm. I might want to say, well, uh, my aim this year, my New Year resolution is to lose weight well, or to become a healthier version of myself. Well, that means nothing. I'd rather you say, what do you want to lose? How much do you want to lose? For what reason do you want to lose? But the reason why people don't want to set those goals is because they fear failure. So who should you be comparing yourself to? 
you should be comparing yourself to the better version of yourself that's in line with the goal, the same version of yourself that's chasing the goal. So if my goal is to, I don't know, just as an analogy, lose two kilograms of weight, blah, 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 I should be comparing myself to the person, my version, that is busy doing that, not to the social media influencer that's you know, right. not really portraying a real version of themselves. You must remember, we're talking about social media now. It's not real. What you're seeing is it's not even a, a, a part of somebody's life. It's a made up part of life. It's not real. So comparing your real life to somebody else's imagined life, it's comparing yourself to a fantasy. It doesn't work and it makes you feel worse. Could not agree more. So, all right. I mean, this helps with a, a lot of people and their social media anxieties. Uh, Leanne, you look like you got something to ask before I carry on. Give you a gap here. No, it's just, it's, it's interesting how um, we talk about reality versus, um, you know, people's lives that they're put on for show. Um, and I was just speaking to Gareth earlier about this Love is Blind uh, series where you, you set up with these people and you end up marrying them and how much stuff comes out in social media. You know, we all watch the show and we all create our own opinions. And once it's available to the public, members of the public start coming out saying, oh, I actually dated that guy. He pulled a gun on me. He was abusive. Oh. Um, I actually saw that star that married so-and-so. He stole my friend's phone and her wallet. Um, and how the, the pressure that these people are facing now, yes, they signed, signed up to go on to the show themselves and they signed these, these contracts. But um, you can see some of them like breaking down now. Social media is literally ripping into them and they're losing a sense of who they are. It's, yeah, look, it's I mean, very, we, very powerful. You know, we, we place these, never mind we see these fantasies, but we almost play into them and expect these couples to be real. We expect mm. the love at first sight. We expect them to happily ever after with no real issues, no real conflict, no real drama. But in reality, listen, the moment you're put onto, on planet Earth, you sign a contract and it says you are going to go through drama. You are going to go through conflict. You are going to go through disappointment. Somebody's going to let you down at some point. Suffering is part of the deal. You're going to go through grief and loss. That is part and parcel of life. And you're going to go through it whether you're alone or whether you're in a relationship. That is, the universe doesn't offer you a deal where that's not part of the deal. That's going to be part of the deal. What's part of the deal is, are you going to do something productive with it and get over it and learn and adapt and become a better version of yourself? Or are you going to let that sink you? And if you're going to, and that's up to you. That's not up to the universe. That's you choose. That's for you to own. And if you don't pick a position, then the universe just picks one for you. So you mm -hmm. want to be, you don't want to eliminate those things because you can't. You want to learn how to manage it and move forward. You know, did I ever share with you um, the donkey and the tiger story? Did I ever share that on the show? No, go ahead. This is this is my favorite story because the, the punchline and the moral is brilliant, especially for our topic today. So the story is of the donkey is having an argument with a tiger. And the donkey says that the grass is blue and the, uh, the um, tiger is saying that the grass is green. So they're going back and forth, the donkey giving his side of the argument while the grass is blue and the tiger saying that the grass is green. They're going back and forth and it's really raucous and it's really violent. It's almost becoming physical. So they decide, look, let's go to get judgment from the king of the jungle. So they turn to the lion and they say, your highness, who's right? Me, the donkey that believes that the grass is blue or me, the tiger that believes the grass is green. And the lion turns to the donkey and goes, you are right. The grass is blue. And he punishes the tiger. And the donkey leaves all smug and happy that he's won the argument. And once a donkey leaves, the tiger turns to the lion and says, Your Majesty, why? I'll take the punishment. I'll take it. But why did you punish me when we both know that the grass is green? And the lion turns to the tiger and says, I didn't punish you because you were right. I punished you because you were arguing with a donkey. <laughs> and how many of us argue with donkeys, people that add no value to our lives, whether it's social media, how many donkeys are there on social media? When we engage on, on uh, watch things that are donkeys, engage with conversations that are donkeys. The, you remember we discussed the coin theory many times. 
engage mm -hmm. in things that add value to your life. Donkeys decrease value. You want to engage mm -hmm. with things that add to your world, not things that take away from your world. And I think the message for this week, and I challenge everybody to, is to not engage with donkeys. I love it. <laughs> Love it. We're going to have to leave it there. I just have to throw this in. This is pretty hilarious. Uh, joking Atheist says he's definitely going to confront me on the 13th of June, 2029, about this show today. And I must not look forward to that. I've got to prepare for a real fight, perhaps my first. So I'm getting ready. Thank you, Joking Atheist. <laughs> Love it. All right, Doc, very good to see you. We will right, check guys, in with you in a week's you. time. Lovely. See Dr. You Hanani, Bye. Bye. everybody. Bye. Cheers, cheers. Don't argue with donkeys. Good advice. First yeah. thing on a Monday morning. All right, we'll be back in uh, just a couple of seconds with a whole lot more, cliffcentral.com and uh, The Real Network and Leanne Moll on, on our show this morning. We've also got a special guest, somebody I've been waiting to get on the show for a long time because she makes me laugh. Uh, it's uh, somebody called Shelley Bennett, who you'll get to meet in the next couple of minutes. I think you're going to enjoy her too. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. It is a beautiful Monday morning. This week on the Auto Trader Podcast. This past week we did a super cool um, Tuesday post, right, where we pitted the, I guess the, the two premier sort of luxury sports SUVs right now, um, which was the MG GLE 63S versus the X6M. I don't know if either of you have driven those cars as of yet. Uh, previous gen models. The, yeah. the new ones, no, yeah. but I know exactly where my money is going if it, if it was my 3 million rand. Yeah. What, the, the X6 or the Mercedes AMG? Oh, no, no, it's going to be the GLC all the way. Really? Dude, I do not like the way the X6 looks, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, of I don't like the way it looks. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Any sort of... Well, um, BMX 6 drivers usually tend to put me off. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Catch us every Monday at 9 a.m. on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za. All right, all right, all right. Monday morning, and today is what the 11th of March. Oh my God! All right, we got so uh, so much. So much it's just so much to still do. Uh, it can't be the 11th of March already, mm. but it is. Um, okay, so uh, a couple of things that are in the news this morning that we want to pay attention to. Apparently, the the Isle of Man. Now, uh, you you know Rich Mulholland and his wife Jasmine, who's been on the show before. They've moved to the Isle of Man. Mm. Terrible place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, au contraire. <laughs> no, so apparently the reason the Isle of Man is in the news is because they're looking to attract South Africans to live there. 
The Isle of Man's government hopes to attract 15,000 new re residents in the next five to seven years. South Africans are a target demographic for them, apparently. There are currently over 8,000 South Africans living on the Isle of Man. We're from the Isle of Man. My <laughs> sister and I have lived here all our life. <laughs> Where's that from? <laughs> the past show they've got these two people and they're supposedly brother and sister but they're also married to each other and then they're from the isle of man so that's why whenever you i think almost, of the isle you almost said they're they're asking south african relatives instead know, of relatives. Thinking, right <laughs> exactly i was thinking that so anyway uh 10 of the population of the isle of man is south african believe it or mm. not one in every 10 people. Uh, the Isle of Man has a low crime rate. Well, not with all those South Africans they're importing. Uh, <laughs> Corruption government. levels are on the rise. Stable government. Again, let the South Africans hang around long enough, you'll get an unstable government. Um, strong education system, short commute times. There are also many job openings on the island in finance, digital spaces, and hospitality. The Isle of Man government is offering financial incentives to businesses and individuals to relocate to the island. Um, that's pretty interesting uh, if you're going to go there. There are so many South Africans on the island that they've had their first ever Saffirs Festival last year. Hmm. Imagine that. Probably <laughs> yeah. the, only, the only thing in the Isle of Man that I definitely would not want to be there for is the <laughs> Saffirs Festival. Can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, so I just thought that was funny because, you know, Richard and Jasmine have moved there, and I thought, well, okay, maybe it's a thing. It turns out it is a thing. There's lots of South Africans doing it. You you thinking you're going to the Isle of Man, Leanne? I, I'm I'm always open to to suge suggestions, but um, I'm just wondering what the weather's like. That's the only thing. Carl says I, I can't understand how in 2024 they can just assume the gender of the Isle of Man. <laughs> 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 well. Um, you're going for your morning hike through the wooded park. You find a duffel bag stuffed with cash. This is joking atheist. About 10 million rand of the cash is bloodied. And the bag also contains a severed human hand. What would you do? For 10 million rand, I'd give it back. You would? Yeah. Not enough for you, hey? No, <laughs> not enough. Not enough. For sure. a, severed, a severed human hand, no thanks. That's freaky. Um, so some of the cash is bloodied. Uh, so I would, I would leave the bloodied cash. <laughs> <laughs> Take all the clean cash. Um, and I'd leave the hand, obviously. I don't have any use for a, a, an extra human hand. So, I mean, this is an obvious one to me. I'll take the, the money that isn't bloodied. I'll put the hand and the bloodied money back in the bag and go about my day. And just walk off whistling away. With your pockets Absolutely. full. Yeah, like some 10 million rand. I mean, like how much of it can be bloodied? A million? Yeah. Still got nine. I'll take it. <laughs> John says the 10 mil is not enough for the problems it could bring you and the family. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. And just the general guilt sitting over your head every time you buy something new. Oh, I bought that vase with the bloodied money underneath the severed hand. <laughs> Cool. You've got a nice vase. That's what I would do. <laughs> All right. So, so never ever one to leave us uh, doubting that that she has care for the elder, elderly and the you know the infirm. Leanne Moll has found out about terminally ill patients who get to live out their final wishes thanks to an ambulance wish foundation in the Netherlands. This is a real thing. Yes. So it's what almost it? it's almost like the Wish Foundation, and I think they may be connected. But uh, the Wish Foundation is very much focused on children and, you know, their wishes. Mm -hmm. they the make a wish. Them. Oh, that, yes, yeah, sorry, make a wish. Um, with this, it's terminally ill patients. So what happened was there was an ambulance driver in, in uh, the Netherlands um, and he was transferring a patient um, and he, while he was transferring this patient, the person said, I, I really wish that I could see the sea before I go. Um, and this guy, is, this guy, Kies Feltboer, um, in 2006, he said, you know, this guy had spent three months confined to a hospital bed 
um, while he was going from this one hospital uh, hospital to the other, he just saw, thought, "I'm going to pull. I'm, I'm going to drive to the sea and pull over and let this man just look at the sea." Oh. And he saw this man just crying um, with tears of joy, you know, streaming down his face, and he said that's what I want to do in my life. This is what my purpose is. So he started the Ambulance Wish Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he does is he arranges these last wishes for these patients, no matter what they want. Um, and I've sent you some pictures, which were just like really powerful photographs, I think. Um, so this guy over here just wanted to watch some dolphins. So he took him to an aquarium um, and uh, basically they go with a whole team. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a lot has to happen when you're transporting a terminally ill patient. You need to have a team of support in case something goes wrong. Um, he's usually got a lot of equipment around him that he needs, breathing equipment. So this foundation arranges all of that. But there's this, this man who just wanted to see some dolphins playing in the, in, in the uh, uh, water. This one with the giraffe, um, you'll see a man lying in his hospital bed um, and a giraffe coming up really close to him. So what happened is um, this guy, his name was Mario, 54 mm -hmm. years old, and he oh, wanted to Mario. say goodbye to his favorite giraffe. Yes. So he had worked at a maintenance, uh, in a maintenance position at Rotterdam Zoo for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And after his shifts, he would go and visit, especially the giraffes. Um, so as his, you know, brain cancer battle was coming to an end, he wanted to visit the zoo one last time and say goodbye to some of his giraffes. And that's what this, this amazing organization did, was allowed him to go and do that. These Amazing. are, <laughs> this woman, she just simply wanted to go into the town square and have an ice cream cone. That's um, nice. And that's, yeah, that's what, what she ended up doing. Okay. And then uh, this old guy stole her ice cream cone. Is that right? <laughs> I'm not sure who he is. <laughs> oh, wow. The, these guys visited the Rakes Museum and they went to see Rembrandt, uh, a couple yes. of his paintings. Wow. Yes. So it was a patient who wanted to see her favorite Rembrandt painting again. Um, and hmm. this image seemed to be the most powerful for me. But uh, that was her. She said, I want to see my favorite painting one last time. And so they, sure. they took her. And then there you'll see an entire team sitting with her. Yeah. I mean, listen, it must be a hell of a schlep to, uh, to take these people around with <laughs> All of the breathing <laughs> equipment and uh, you know the the bed and but it's it's incredible what can be done you know and and I think it's such a gap that uh, this guy's discovered where old people want to see this last thing they want to have their last wish come true and and I think it's beautiful obviously well who would be who would be against this it's terrific love it what would yours be if you uh, if you only had a, a month to go what would you want to do oh gosh. I think I think I, I think probably overlooking the sea or something like that would be lovely, but sort of um you know somewhere quite remote and rural, but that would be a bit of a problem for them. But uh, yeah, just to go to a quiet place in the fame boss, overlooking they the sea, smelling you. smelling the sea. They could just leave you there or, or tip you over from your bed into the, <laughs> the, uh, the ravine. <laughs> So this is the, this is quite an interesting little survey. Apparently, South Africa's mental health continues to rank among the bottom three countries in the world. Is this true? It's true. It's just come out. And I got quite a shock when I saw it. Um, so yes, this is a this is their fourth time that they've done this. Uh, mm -hmm. They're called the Mental State of the World Report. Okay. And South Africa has been ranked at the bottom before. It's um, an annual Sapien Labs mental health report, and it focused right. on the dr dramatic decline in mental well-being around the world from 2019, 2020, 21. And that was like such a, a poignant time because of COVID at the time. Sure. Um, so I'm hoping that people are feeling better this year. But yes, <laughs> South Africa was third last in, oh in the God. rankings. So we really, 
we we need Dr. Renan on in the in yeah. Monday. We need him more than we knew. Yes, Is that right? One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So the the researchers had kind of thought that they would see things, you know, getting better after COVID, but they found that the younger generations, particularly people under thirty five, were still in decline. Um, those over sixty five remained steady um, at the top. So. The, the healthiest mindsets are in the Dominican Republic, mm-hmm. Sri Lanka, mm-hmm. and Tanzania. Mm. So, so they had these, these scores, they call it the mental health quotient, or the MHQ, through this assessment that they do. Um, they had a score of 88 or higher. And then the four at the bottom were Brazil in fourth place, South Africa, in th- uh, third, third to bottom, the yep. UK were yep. even worse than us, and Uzbekistan were at the bottom. Oh my God, Uzbekistan! So I heard about the UK being the second most. They termed it the second most miserable country. So yes. That makes us makes us the third most miserable country in the world. Can you believe it? Oh my God, it's very depressing. That is very, very depressing. I'm I'm not surprised everybody's popping pills and uh, trying to find <laughs> things to make them feel better. Look, Get I mean, we, yeah. we have to remember our unemployment rate. How can you possibly be happy when you're unemployed and struggling the day to day? You know, yeah, there's just distrust at the moment in, in our political parties. Yeah. As much as when South Africans get together, like I'm sure at this Saffirs thing in, in the Isle of Man, as much as we can get together and celebrate and mark things in a positive way, and stand together. I think deep down we're just flipping. We've had enough. Um, I was looking at this Jocelyn Smith case. Oh, it's a horrible story. Mm. So um, apparent, apparently yes. they've, they've, they've done some investigation. Just correct me where I'm wrong here. But this girl went missing. It was all over the news. There was a big fuss being made. Can we help find her? Everybody was looking for her. They, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't track her down. Then the police eventually found some fragments of clothing or something. Turns out this little girl's mother and her boyfriend tried to sell the child for 20,000 rand. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Oh, my God. So they've, they've already appeared in court on the charge. Um, they were trying to apparently sell her to a Sangoma. So, st- but still nobody knows where she is. So the search continues. They've been... There's been a bit of political infighting as well because the DA actually used a poster of Jocelyn Smith and said the police are giving up and we're stepping in with our own funding to find um, this child. You know, the community has is very strong in the area where this has occurred and they've all stood up. They're very much into this like vigilante, um, you know, facing yeah. facing justice and just being positive, uplifting people. So they're absolutely shocked by hearing what's happened here. Um, and they're, they're actually building up on mass. But, uh, yeah, I've even seen, um, you know, um, Americans who follow these sort of creepy stories or crazy or on-the-edge stories are mm-hmm. talking about this case and saying how disgusting it is. And a lot of the South Africans in the comments are saying, we're actually really embarrassed about this. It's, you know, it's absolutely appalling. But you see, again, when people talk about what a crime riddled country we are, and we are, we have problems. um, I always think a lot of our problems aren't because the government isn't doing their job. They aren't because people are running around and opportunistically just murdering and raping each other. A lot of this stuff is about the breakdown of the family. And you've got to ask, what kind of a mom would put a price of 20,000 rand on her child's head? I mean, there's something totally, totally sick about that. And it doesn't have to do with government. It doesn't have to do with police. And it doesn't have to do with the law, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a sickness. Something really awful about a person who would do that. So I saw an interview. If I sell a child of mine, it would at least be 100,000 rand. (laughs) I saw an interview where this person who was interviewing um, the mother obviously had a hidden camera. I don't know if it was for a job interview or something like that. Yeah. He was probing her drug use. um, And he said, are you not using tick anymore? And she said, no, I'm, I'm completely sober. I don't use it anymore. Um, 
and my boyfriend, he's also stopped. And he said, well, when did you stop? And she said something like Thursday. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, God. That's so, horrific. you know, you know what she wants the money for, right? 20,000 yeah. rand. Yeah. Quick fix. Okay. That's right. Gail Force yeah. says Justin's mother's a drug addict. All right. Well, mm. that's a very depressing story, but we had to mention it. And I'm glad yeah. we've, uh, we've spoken about it this morning. But let's turn our attention to someone who's, uh, who's always made me laugh. And um, I often get like messages on social media. Well, and in, 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 uh, we, we've got each other's WhatsApps as well. We worked together on a project not so long ago. And I just thought she's one of the most fun, optimistic, hilarious, brilliant people that I've met. And I wanted to introduce her to you for the longest time. So here she is. Her name is Shelley Bennett. Hey, Shelley. How are you? Uh, I'm good. How are you, Gareth? I'm good, thank you. Um, good. I hope you don't mind the introduction where I said that you're going to amuse us because it sets you up to fail. Um, and obviously, <laughs> obviously, now if you're not, you know, hilariously funny, the audience are going to go, "What the hell? What did you bring this poor woman on for?" But it's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in ages. You moved to Cape Town. I moved down to Cape Town last year in September um, for various reasons. The most important, I always tell you, if I'm not being because I hate Johannesburg, because that's not true at no. all. In fact, I, I miss right. it. So it was not the I hate Joburg and have to get out of here. There are too many potholes issue. And everything no. here is perfect and fabulous because it's not accurate at all. But yeah, I've, I've been here now since September and I'm enjoying it. Uh, but I do miss Joburg. Do you find Cape Town people are very different in, in um, demeanor to Cape uh, to, to Joburg people? Because you... You're pretty much a Joburg person, and you've you've slotted in well in Cape Town, but they are different. Gareth, they're not only different; it's it's it may as well be another country. And and I'm not <laughs> talking about politically; I'm talking about just socially. And no. I think I've must, I've got Joburg written all over my face. I mean, I, I stand out like a sore because the first thing people say to me when they meet me is, "You're not from Cape Town." So clearly, no. and, and I haven't had a t-shirt made or a sweatshirt or anything. So <laughs> they they definitely just and it's written all over me and. We are different. Joburg people are different. There is no. We are two different countries. Joburg yeah. and Cape Town. So, so what are they like socially if you live there? Because whenever I go down there, it's for a visit, and I think people make an effort. Um, maybe they, they, you know, they only do something at the end of the month. I'm not sure, but most of the people I know who've moved down there say no, no. They're still friends with Joburg people who've moved to Cape Town because the Cape Townians just you don't see them most of the time. They hide. Well, you know, that not only that do they hide, they live in such little bubbles here. It's not even like a big bubble. Every, they, they, I mean, in Joburg's a bubble within, you know, itself. But Cape Town, you've got, there's a Clifton bubble, a, a Sea Point bubble, a Constantia bubble. Yeah. The bubbles are all so self-contained and so tight. Um, yeah. I have a lot of Cape Town friends from over years, which I'm fortunate about, we're fortunate for that because if I didn't, I would never, ever, there's nobody in Cape Town who would be friends with me. I, I, I say too much. I speak my mind. I mean, I'm just don't, I'm just never going to fit in here. It's just one of those things. And I talk too fast. You know, they, they, they my, my, I've always spoken quickly and Cape Town people, they do, they just speak slowly. Yeah. Um, and they are, they, they, people say they're clicky. I don't believe that. I don't think they're clicky. I think they're safe in their own space. So, well, I mean, Leanne moved down there. She lived in the Cape for a little while. And, and mm -hmm. your experience is it different to Shelley's or is it exactly the same? No, it, very, very similar. Um, I also found that not only did the people speak slowly, but even if you were at a traffic light, the traffic lights take so long to turn green. <laughs> I was, you, you kind of panic, you know, you end up falling asleep sometimes before the, the traffic lights even turn green. Um, but also I was I was in Colk, Colk Bay, so it is very kind of insulated as well. Um, and then I was in McGregor for a while, which is also very isolated. Um, so, yes, you, you kind of live in these villages and you don't know much about what's going on beyond that. Whereas if you're in Joburg, you could live like I do in the parks of Joburg, work in four ways, a family on the East Rand. <laughs> so you, you, you know, you end up traveling Joburg properly. But in Cape Town, you, you don't really. 
Well, you, you know, if I can add, I, I'm living in, in Seapoint at the moment and very keen to move to the suburbs. I, I find at Seapoint, I imagined it to be in my head how I thought it would be from spending holidays here. And it's very different to live here. So mm -hmm. I now want to be in the suburbs and kind of like, I, and I've got close friends here saying, oh, no, 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 no. You know, you'll never see us if you go to the suburbs. You'll just never see us. And I'm yes. thinking, Newlands is 15 minutes away. I mean, you could walk there. I mean, yeah. it, no, 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 no. The suburbs, then you can't see us. And what you say about the traffic lights, I, you're making me laugh because mm -hmm. I, the first, I thought, you know what, this traffic light's broken. In Joburg, mm -hmm. you all just go by then anyway and treat it as a four way stop because, you know, what, why not? You've got 14 homeless people. Can, you know, directing you and everybody's, you know, doing their own thing and the taxi's going, overtaking you and going through, which I quite like because it's, you know, that's, they, they have a, a mission and they get with it and they go. It's yeah, that robot, yeah, you sit at the robot and, and the robot's read for everybody and you think, no, 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 this robot's broken, but robots, yeah, don't break. So you wait and you wait and, and then you realize that actually the, the pedestrians are so I've got to be very careful what words I use here, but they're so relaxed and chilled that they yeah. need the robot to be complete. Oh, that, that little man yeah. must be green. And there's no looking to see if someone's turning a corner. So they make all the robots red and the green men green. And then everybody casually starts strolling across the road so that nobody can get run over. Well, I've been crossing roads with red robots my whole life and never been run over. So <laughs> that red for everybody for 14 days just does not get me. I, I, and I did. The first few times, I'd like you. I thought, oh, so the robot's broken. So here in Joburg, you look, you make a plan, you make a decision, and someone goes, and then everybody follows, because that's what we do in Joburg. Yeah. Not here. You would be there for three days ordering, you know, Uber Eats for your coffee. I, I, yeah. It, it's, 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 it's bizarre. No, it's so crazy. I, I think there, there are a couple of things it's about bizarre. you that I, that I find Sorry. very interesting. I mean, you, you've... You've been in the events industry for years. So you were at uh, Sun International. You worked at the Sun City Super Bowl. So you must have seen and, and heard some amazing things there. But you also had your own company, and that closed during COVID. And that was your excuse to go to Cape Town, right? You know, Gareth, it was partly my excuse because I've been encouraged by my son who lives here for many years. And I kept using the excuse that I can't. My business is in Joburg. And no. then when, it, when we closed, I... I, I debated and thought about it, and I then sold my home just before everybody in Joburg couldn't sell their home. So that was quite, quite mm. a, a good thing. And <laughs> ended up um, living in, a, in an apartment in Ilovo where everyone told me, oh, you know, don't walk in Ilovo. Oh, no, no, no. It's very dangerous. Terribly mm. very dangerous. Good. So with that, I took my two dashes every morning and walked down to the park and bought coffee and met amazing people, including the men with their gathering all the, their plastics and everything who, you know, when I watched them racing down the road, you know, getting speeding fines on those trolleys yeah. and they had no shoes on, I was happily negotiating and buying everybody tackies from, you know, Mr. Price and, and six pairs of socks with the tackies because mm -hmm. they just do, they, they're proactive and they do stuff. So I, and I kept saying to people, well, I walk around Ilovo and, and Melrose every day for an hour every morning with my dogs. And so far, you know, I'm really fine. Nobody, obviously, I'm just not attackable because nobody's attacking me. <laughs> and I, frankly, when I, then my, my partner was headhunted. He was in Saudi Arabia and he was headhunted for a job here. So mm -hmm. he said, listen, you you've careful. always wanted you to be careful. You've got to be careful saying uh, headhunted in Saudi Arabia in the same sentence. That could be dangerous. <laughs> That's very dangerous. Because... <laughs> Especially because struggling. <Yeah. laughs> I think he was he was very happy to get out of there because there was a lot of head stuffs going on that mm -hmm. we never hear about. It was fasc it's fasc it's a fascinating uh, side of, of, of the world, fascinating. And then when I got here, to be honest, I, I have been a little bit disappointed. Um, I, felt, I, I kind of had this idea in my head that you you know you walk on the promenade with your dogs and it's so beautiful uh -huh. and the fresh air and uh -huh. the, no 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 uh 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 not like that at all. You, the, the promenade, they, they try really hard, and I give you Cape Town 11 out of 10. But you have so many, and it kills me, so many, and they, they really, I talk to everybody. So, I mean, the homeless people, as I arrive, if I've got one dog with me and not another, they ask me, where's Shiloh? Where's Bailey? You know, why, why didn't you bring Shiloh this morning? <laughs> they all know my dog's name. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I say, no, Shiloh's old, and, you know, she sleeps late, so she'll come later. But they are all... The, the 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 promenade is not it's it's they keep it clean so they quickly clean it up and then it gets 
really grand, the grandstanding. Yeah. So, you know, they're trying, but it, it, so the, the police come every morning at seven o'clock and they're not aggressive at all. They, they drive along the promenade between quarter to seven and they move all the homeless, you know, a block. And then but, as they're at the next block, they come back. But where are these home? I mean, these homeless people now sleep on the promenade if they got their little uh, little boxes and God knows what else they live in, and they just they live on the Sea Point Promenade. They absolutely do, and and on every side street. I mean, I I've moved further back. I was right on the promenade, and every day that I came out of my home onto the the, the road, which is a, a, a you know on the corner of. of uh, beach road and whichever road there are homeless people on every in every side road and all over the, the and then they sleep on the benches so the, the the police move them so then they but then the same guys are there every i've been there six months i've, I've got the, the same people are there every day and when i say to them you know would you go into a shelter no there's nowhere to go there's nowhere to go mm. you know it's, tra- it's, it's awful this is this is an interesting problem because they've got the same thing in California at the moment. They've got exactly the same problem in Los Angeles and and uh, specifically in San Francisco, where these homeless people come there because the the weather is good. So what you've got to hope for is like a really horrible winter, and maybe they'll just uh, chase the homeless people away. I mean that's that's really the, the, re- the problem. They, seriously, that's the reason that they go to these California cities, and yeah. and then they. You know, most of them are drug addicts, and I think that probably that's true for the Cape Tonian ones as well. Is that these guys are like high all the time? So, wouldn't you rather be high in a pretty place like Sea Point than high in a an ugly place like Bromfontein? You know, the, it's, you say that about the drugs. So, I was in an apartment quite quite high up in a building, and I used to say that my my landlord should have rented it out to a drug dealer because you could watch the drug deals taking place all along that promenade from the window. Yeah. Um, and it, but it's it's huge. It's a huge issue, and yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you be a drug addict on on the promenade and Sea Point or, or or you know Bantry Bay yeah. or wherever? I I yeah. would if I was going to do that. That's my first choice. Where am I going? I'm <laughs> absolutely not going to Bromfontein. And and I want to tell you, I, I it, it's a great life. They they swim in the morning. They go and have a swim, and they get out again, and they they lie on that promenade and they talk to everybody's dogs. And I mean, a lot of people obviously just walk away and ignore them. Don't talk to me. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a kind of I, I'm fascinated how they got to that point. Yeah. And I Listen, but they, when you, they're not they're not proactive. You, they they have no effort to do anything other than be stoned all day and, and watch the seagulls. And you know what? Mm. There are people that have always been people like that. But when you're sitting in, in your apartment, you were looking down on these drug deals. Did you ever see anyone that you knew uh buying from the uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been funny. Uh, let me tell you, I've, my my camera takes great videos. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> got some, got and some I'm not in, selling my children. Evidence. I'm not selling my children yet, but I want to tell you, I would sell that evidence off my camera. Yeah, I'm sure there's <laughs> good stuff there. Listen, Cape Town is a it's a very international city. So you've got people who uh, are, are, are living there for just part of the year, and. Um, you know what the EFF wants to do, right? They want to take away all the people's holiday homes. So if you have if you have a beautiful house in, in Clifton or Camps Bay and you're only there for like a month of the year, then the EFF reckons that what they should do is take your house and give it to those homeless people because, of course, that will solve all the problems because the homeless people will look after the apartment beautifully and then when you come back for your holiday, it'll be ready for you and they'll, you know, what. Your washing will be done. Your sheets will be yeah. ironed. There'll be chocolates yeah, on the pillowcase. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, and, then what, when you're in, and when you're in, when you're in residence, when you're here on holiday, they can work for you, and you can pay them to work for you, and then they will have money for drugs, and everybody will be happy. I actually think it's a bloody good idea. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to be voting EFF, I can tell. I, I don't um, want to vote for them personally, but I think I could set up a whole company like this, encourage the homeless. I know all the empty apartments, and there are masses of them and homes, and we could be we, we could really do something worthwhile. So listen, I mean, you do love dogs. You've got these two dogs of yours. Um, I've I spent uh, this weekend doing quite a lot of dog things because um, we we went on a little dog walk to raise money for the poor dogs. You know, I don't want homeless dogs sitting outside my house. So, <laughs> um, so you know, we've got to do our. Everybody has to do our bit. But um, Cape Town is probably a really good place for dogs. Are they much happier there than they were in Joburg? 
I, you know what? I'd like to say yes, but my dogs are not impressed by the ocean at all. As far as they're concerned, it's really overrated. They, they, I took them to the beach the one day, and my my one just put the paw down, and that all that sandy, grainy stuff was like, why am I doing this? I'd really be so much happier if I was on beautiful lawn. I mean, and the pavements in 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 Joburg are much better because they're full of they're all lawned. I mean, most of the good the northern suburbs, the, the pavements are great. Mm. Um, you know, there's no lawn here in in in, yeah. in the side of, of Cape yeah. Town. So yeah, no, my dogs are not happy. They're happy because they're happy with me, but they know they they they're not impressed. They think the sea is overrated, and um, they like the fact that all there are a lot of people to chat to on the promenade. But other than that, they're not impressed at all. I t I tell you what, my I felt the same thing with my animals. I took um, my little miniature pincher with me to live with me there, and four cats, and they're definitely Joburg animals. Because the miniature pincher, when I took him to the sea for the first time, I've actually got a video of it because I, I was so excited he was going to see the beach. And he was not impressed. He was running, firstly, away from the sea as it was approaching him. And then a train came past, as it does in Cork Bay. And he was kind of stuck between the waves and the train and didn't know where to go and was like zigzagging. He couldn't cross over the railways because his little feet would get stuck in the railing, in the rails. Oh, um, the cats were not happy. They had to fight off a cobra in in, uh, in McGregor. The one fell into the, the Levata Dam. She came out not impressed. Uh, the other got stuck in, a, in a, a trough where the horses eat. And I just thought, what am I doing to these animals? They are so Trauma. happy in Joburg. So happy. <laughs> you just get Joburg so animals, you know. Exactly what I was going to say. You get Jemina or Joburg animals. And, and people keep saying to me, but why don't you take them to the beach? Because they don't want to go to the beach. They, they don't get the beach. It's, they, they do not get the beach at all. That's, they're not impressed at all. But you, but you have, I mean, you, you've, you've now been unmarried for some time since, uh, since the last ex-husband. And what's life like there? Because, I mean, Leanne, I always tease Leanne about, you know, being a, a an old spinster. But the reality is, like, there's there's so much more to do these days. And for people, I'm also single. I mean, for God's sake, I, I wouldn't want to change that for the world at the moment. Because as far as I'm concerned, I have the opportunity to go anywhere, do anything. I don't have to worry about anything but the dog, um, which means that I've got maximum freedom. But I think that there are still people in this world who who really do long to be with someone. Is Cape Town the sort of place where anyone can meet people, or is it not like that at all? So I th I think, and I mean, I had a, a, a obviously a lack of fortune. I had a large group of friends in Joburg. I've lived there most of my life. There is no doubt for me that it, it's very personality driven. I have always no. been very happy to be on my own. I have no issue with being on my own. It's never been an issue for me. I love my own company. It's not an issue. I think as a single person, there's a lot more to do in Cape Town with, with groups of people. So if you're a person who gets lonely and doesn't want to be on your own, there are so many things to do with groups. You know, you can join a, a, a million groups, a theater, a, a, you know, wine tasting, whatever, they, which I never found in Joburg, perhaps because I never really looked or didn't want to, I, I maybe. Yeah. But I think Cape Town, if you're a single person on your own, not about maybe meeting a partner, but about having groups of people and stuff to do every weekend with people, very much so, much better mm -hmm. than Joburg. And there are also ways that you can entertain yourself, even if you are, um, you know, just single. You, taking a walk along the promenade, taking a walk along the beach, uh, taking a walk up a mountain. But what are we going to do in Joburg? Walk to the spa, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's just a bit lame here in terms of activities, you know? And all of it involves drinking, funnily enough, in Joburg. You you know, you go to a pub or you, you buy wine and go to, for a picnic or you buy beers and go for a braai. Whereas there are a lot more things that you can do in Cape Town that don't necessarily involve alcohol. I also find, it, especially having animals, I mean, if you want to meet people in Cape Town, Gareth, it's very simple. You go and buy a puppy, a yes. really cute puppy, and you walk mm -hmm. along that promenade. I mean, I must have accosted 20 people with puppies, and I have to have pick the puppy up, and I have to kiss it. So, I mean, I met so many people who would they, – they're quite taken aback initially because you. I'm, I am a bit careful. I would usually just grab the puppy and kiss it, but I've learned to say, excuse me, you know, do you mind? Can, can, I? I, can I? May mm -hmm. I? And then there's quite a few uh, people uh, – and men particularly say, no, no, snuggle the puppy. And they would give me the puppy, have a snuggle, have a snuggle. And yeah. then, so you you can, and people,
people are. People say Cape, Cape Townians aren't friendly. They are friendly, but then they don't they they don't take it forward. Mm. So they'll well, chat I mean, to you. And so then that's you, you did. You're gone. That, this idea that you you now have to ask permission before you can uh, like pat someone's dog. And I mean, this used to be a thing only for babies because. I've never understood people who just go up to a pregnant woman and like start rubbing her belly or whatever, but this, this happens. And uh, at some point it was decided that we've got to be a little more polite and you actually should ask like, do you mind if I like hold your baby or if I, you know, sort of look at your baby because people are weird and, and, and they, they just assume that it's okay to touch things that are not theirs. I've, I must be honest, I find that very invasive. And I also, for all you know, the dog, I mean, a puppy does hopefully it's not going to bite you, but their dog might bite. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I, I would always <laughs> ask. And um, the other thing I found interesting with a, a lot of people on a Sunday, because the promenade gets ridiculous on a Sunday. So if you, if I used to walk quite late on a Sunday afternoon, about 5, 5.30, there are lots of little kids on a Sunday because it's mass, mass entrance into Seapoint on a Sunday if the weather's good. I mean, that whole promenade is just covered in picnic blankets and people and picnics and entire, you know, families, extended families, and their aunt that they hate nobody talks to because then you can mix her with the crowd. And <laughs> the kids always are scared of dogs. They're not, they don't have animals, mm. but the, the parents want them to be not scared of dogs. And I've got a very old Dutch and so they would always come to me and say, you know, do you mind if I, if I child, and I'd say, no, you know, play it. We, we have like a whole... 15, 20 minutes where the child would be playing with the dog to try and get used to the animals. And then I do a whole animal thing where you should introduce an animal into your family and it's very healthy for your children, but then you've got to look after the dog, blah, blah. But you don't get any of that in Joburg. You would never, where would you go in Joburg where you interact with people en masse of all different cultures, hey, have demographics? You ever, have you ever seen Cyril? Uh, the president goes running on the promenade occasionally. Have you ever seen the president there? I think if Cyril goes on the, on the promenade, he goes very, very early in the morning. Um, I, I, I do regularly see his wife, but I don't, don't see him. Mm, he's, okay. he's, I I think maybe he's, his promenade experiences, I think, are very much – I think they're publicity-driven, and he's on the promenade, and it's publicity, and then he goes home, and he doesn't come back again for six months. <laughs> that's probably about right. Yeah, that's probably yeah. about right. Okay, so – And I think that's someone, the truth. So Hermin says here, this is interesting because we, we, you know, we often will, will breeze past a, a homeless people story in the news. But I think one of the interesting things about talking to you this morning is that this is actually going on and it's not making the news anymore. It's just, it's like now considered part of life in Cape Town. So Hermin says, there's a person living in the garage of our holiday home. When we get there, he sneaks out and then comes back when we leave. I feel sorry for him. We've never met. <laughs> 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 right leave what? him a little leave him a note leave him a little right. note and a little care package and say please we want to meet you when you're here yeah you know, like father christmas uh, every year you just leave him some cookies and milk <laughs> exactly and he comes back <laughs> wow it's pretty it, it is it is an amazing thing that you've got this really really wealthy you know and i suppose the same is true for like santon and alex which are right across the uh, the n1 from each other but I often think M1 rather. I often think about Cape Town because you've got Seapoint and, and and places like Clifton where we've got these you know, 70, 100, 120 million rand apartments. And then you've got people living in a box, in a stone's throw away. Yeah. It's the most incredible contrast. And and mm. obviously you, know, you feel sorry for the people in the in the boxes, but you also wonder what happened to them. And how they got there, because I reckon you must have heard some pretty amazing stories. You said you talk to these people. You don't ignore them. Like a lot of people just walk past and ignore them. You know, sadly, people do ignore them. And I think it's based a lot on a fear. They think mm. they're going to, you know, be dangerous, which there's no doubt if, if a lot of them are very, very drugged up, they, they could be. But, you know, I chatted to one lady the one day and she was, it, it fat, she floored me because she was, she was incredibly well-spoken and she told me she was a poet hmm. and she was originally from Soweto. And hmm. I said to her, well, you know, how did you get here? She said, well, because I'm a gypsy. So I'm not suggesting that maybe with the, the the drugging and everything, it may be fantasized to a whole world. But her, oh. the, her, the, her, the way she she communicated with me in her speech was uh, she spoke beautifully and she quoted incredible things that I just thought she can't be making this up. And 
when I said to her, well, you know, how did you get to the point where you actually said, no, 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 maybe from she was humiliated and didn't want to say, well, I'm homeless and I've got nothing and I've lost everything and mm. I lost it through to being a drug addict or whatever. But she said, no, I'm a gypsy and I like to go from place to place and be outside and in the open. And she yeah, fascinated right. me. I, I, yeah, but, but she was. Mm. The sad part for me is that you land up like that by – default and i think how terrible that you could not turn to a member of family a friend and anybody because she was not an uneducated no hope person in my yeah. opinion at all she was a very intelligent woman well you heard you heard leanne talking about the the mental health situation we've got in south africa that according to this this research that they've just completed now uh, we're in the in the bottom three most miserable countries in the world from a mental health point of view um, and that doesn't surprise me at all. I think especially with young people, they're feeling a little bit hopeless. But there's also this thing, and I don't know if this is your experience, Shirley, but it's certainly mine, that a lot of um, young people, are they choose to be identified by their mental health problems. Um, and we spoke to Dr. Hanan earlier this morning. It's like you introduce yourself to somebody and they're like, hi, uh, my name's Kathy and uh, I'm depressed. You're like, wow, what a way to introduce yourself. But this seems to be part of the identity for some of these people. Is that your experience when you meet these people on the street? Very much so. But I, I really do believe, and I mean, I'm, I'm very much a believer that in, in you know, mental health. And I, when people say to me, well, there's no such thing as depression, well, then you've never, ever experienced life or been depressed because it's a very, very real thing. But mm. I think that social media and the world we live in, whilst it's a good thing that it's been made more, you know, normalized, that you can talk about it and not be shunned. But by the same token, I think it's pushed upon you. So instead of seeing the upside of things or looking for a solution, it's like, oh, well, I can't do this because I'm depressed depressed or I can't cope because I'm depressed. So sadly, I think it's pushed it the other way as well, um, whereas it's an excuse and, and an easy excuse to back down and not try or make the effort. Well, I'm depressed, so I can't do that. Well, yeah. you know what? Pull yourself together, get over yourself and make an effort. Yeah, I mean, people get just give up. 100%. Leanne, we can't hear you. You're, you're on mute. Mute. Sorry, it's about finding the diagnosis and then moving on from there. Yes, sure, spend some time, you know, feeling in shock or, or upset about it, um, but then spend some time on how to work around it because you can't just let your life end because of it and have other people care for you. You have to find ways and means of getting through it. Well, Tracy says uh, there's a lyric in a song. You can get addicted to a certain kind of sadness. I think mm -hmm. that happens to people. Look, it is especially true, and I think this is probably one of the most um, interesting observations that I completely agree with, is that it seems that, and this is K&A's point of view, the anecdotal observation, European and Western countries are more unhappy and depressed than African countries. Uh, and that, that is borne out in those statistics that you read us earlier. I mean, one of the happiest countries is Tanzania. You mm -hmm. know, there's not, that much, there's not that much more in terms of opportunity or or objective happiness in Tanzania than there is here. And yet people there are happier because they, I suppose, just they consider life to be more valuable. Are those your dogs, Shirley? That is my one little dog. Welcoming, welcoming my housekeeper who he adores. So he's, <laughs> she's just walked in. He is beside himself. He hasn't seen her all weekend, which means it's about a year in his life. So he's now completely hysterical. <laughs> you hear the little tippy taps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But your your kids your kids are all grown up and moved out, right? Yeah, my my son very much so. My son lives here in Cape Town, and my daughter lives in Hawaii. Where I oh wow! I hmm. must tell you, out of interest, we're talking about homeless. I went to visit her about eighteen months ago or thereabouts, and the homeless situation there is unbelievably bad. And floored me, really? you know, I kind of felt, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the generation of, you know, Magnum, Hawaii Five O, and I kind of thought I was going to be in, I thought I was going to Hawaii Five O, I was so excited. <laughs> I was going to see, you know, red Ferraris and, and you know, Dobermans around the place. So, well, <laughs> let me tell you something. In in my opinion, uh, with uh, with no disrespect to, to what I'm going to say now, but Hawaii is, is Orange Grove, um, a, a, a big version of Orange Grove. I, you know, go out to an island on a big resort. I have no doubt you're going to get great food and a beautiful beach and it's going to be fabulous. But Honolulu is Orange Grove with big shopping centers. <laughs> and the homeless situation there is beyond. I mean, I keep saying, well, why are all these people on the pavement? Mom, they live there. 
What do you mean they live there? Oh oh, this is why. What they? Yeah, the beaches have to get cleared before the season from the homeless. And and the, another thing I have to tell you, which really you need to know if you're going to go to Hawaii, because if you're South African and you go there, this is very distressing. You you get out of your your car in a, in a car park at a shopping centre, and there are millions of chickens. Well, I mean, a chicken in South Africa would last forty two seconds. They would chop its head or pluck it and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting in there. It's like cows in India. They're sacred. Yeah. And I'm saying, oh, cute. The chickens are Mommy, it's not cute. There are chickens everywhere. Chickens. I wow. just see Massive two observations. There. Because I also, when I think about Hawaii, and, and funny enough, we had, um, remember we, we had uh, Jim who, who gives us like financial advice. He moved to Hawaii a little while ago, and he said he's living a, a great life there. And oh, yes. Obviously, you know, you must have these beaches and these beautiful volcanic islands. And I'm sure that Hawaii is magnificent. It's also a bloody long way to go. What's well, like a 40-hour flight to get there, right? 42 hours it took me oh every day. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. But, yeah, you'll just have to, that daughter is now, she's a thing of the past. You're going to have yeah, to Yeah, it's all over. <laughs> it's all she over. Was I mean, she was daughter. my daughter. <laughs> Done, yeah. What was, but, was. But I would never have guessed chickens and homeless people. And listen, you, we've been talking about homeless people a lot this morning. I think you should be the Minister of Homeless Affairs by the end of this. And interesting, if you're homeless in Hawaii and you put your little house on a, on a, on a pavement outside a church, they yes. can't move you. Oh, really? So the church yeah. is uh, like the church in the Middle Ages. Like in the Middle Ages, it's a sanctuary for like hunchbacks and homeless people. 100% and chickens. Chickens. <laughs> amazing. I would and, never and guess. And, and Gareth, you're right. The beaches are amazing. The 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 the, the whole the, the landscape is incredible. I mean, wherever you are, you can see the sea because the, the island's that small to drive from one side to the other mm -hmm. just over an hour. But but on the other side of it, the a, a, the homeless side of it, the expense. You know, I thought I didn't do geography for my trick. I didn't want to. I mean, I want to travel, but I don't want to know where the country is. I just want to go there. And yeah. Hawaii is, is a, you know, the closest part to fly to from Hawaii to America is a six hour flight. I mean, in my world, Hawaii was like a, you know, like the zoo lake. You get on a little boat and you go across and you're in Hawaii. You know, I mean, that was my idea until I booked, until my travel agent told me, you know, not, not so much. So, <laughs> When when I got there, every single thing in Hawaii is imported. From yeah. the milk, mm. the only thing you get in Hawaii is 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 pineapples. Yeah, that's all they grow there. So everything it is so expensive. You you, it's crazy. It's yeah, cra you can't, it's, it's outrageous. It's it's reminding me very much of the Seychelles, which is also an hour from one side to the other. Um, nothing is really produced there besides. Mm bread fruit you know that stinky fruit oh, and you, you go you go if you want to you know the only thing is the fishing is really good so you'll go to the markets and buy amazing fish that have been caught but then to cook them and to find the herbs and spices and the tin foil and things like that you're going to pay through the roof for that and yeah. the middle of it it also looks orange grove you, you know you're either in a resort or you're in absolute poverty how does you you two have put everyone else off. I've always had this fantasy of like living on a tropical island. You've just ruined it. Yeah. You've you made me think of Orange Grove. I mean, Jesus, I don't, I don't know why Orange Grove is coming under such uh, intense scrutiny this morning. I don't think they've deserved it. It's not such a bad place. No, that's why I was very careful to premise that with you. Know, no disrespect, but seriously, I remember driving my first time driving into Honolulu and saying, "But, but this is not Hawaii. This is not Hawaii. This is this mm. is Orange Grove. I mean, where are we?" Very disappointing. <laughs> Gareth, if ever any, my biggest disappointment, because I've always wanted to go there, don't go. Well, I mean, listen, just the fact that it takes you so long to get there is ridiculous. What do you do on a 42-hour flight? You must go numb. Well, what you do in the last section, so the first section you're excited, okay, because you've never been there before. I went, yeah. you can go anywhere you like, because if you take Johannesburg and Hawaii on a, on a, on a, on a globe, it's, it's directly through. It's like putting a pin through. Yeah, correct. So it's the longest you can go around possible. anywhere you like. It's going to take you the same amount of time. Mm. Trip it that you can do from South Africa. So I went via London and then London, LA. 
so when I got to London, I was still excited and I, you know, duty free and I was all happy and I'd had a little nap. And then I got to LA, which was not so cute. By the time I got on the flight from LA to Hawaii, oh, you just cry. You just cry all the way to Hawaii from being overtired. You know, when you, when you get a baby that cries and you say, you know what? You are overtired. You need to go to sleep. I wanted someone to say, you know what, Shelly? You're overtired and hungry. Have a snack. Go to sleep. You'll be fine. Yeah. I was miserable. Mm. Very miserable. Oh, God, that's horrible. Uh, so James, the producer James says pineapples equals pina coladas. That's not such a bad thing to have in abundance. I want to tell you that's a, that, that, that you need them. They need to keep making those pineapples because you need a lot of pina colada to get through Orange Grove. <laughs> <laughs> Mozambique is paradise just up the road, says John Bad Dog. Listen, I mean you uh, you also do some some nice holidays. I saw that last year you'd been to uh, some tropical islands, so you're not totally put off of them. Am I right? I was in Mauritius, in fact, two weeks ago for the 30th time. So Ooh. that says that answers that. Wow. Hmm. Okay. So you like you really like Mauritius. I really, really like Mauritius. And I, I was in Greece last year. Um, I went to Crete and I was in Athens and a couple of the islands. I love islands. That's what I would that's what upset me so much. I am the island, I mean, I'm the island girl poster. I should be that person. And then yeah. I got to Hawaii and was so upset. That's what upset me more than anything, was it? <laughs> I knew I was going to love it and I didn't. It just looked like the, uh, the the most dreary suburb in Joburg. Well, listen, I mean, it's it's all very, uh, it's, it's cool to catch up with you. Thank you for giving us a lot of insight into Cape Town because there may be people, there's this huge wave of semigration that is happening in South Africa where a whole lot of people moving from Johannesburg to Cape Town and uh, we know that the, the population of Cape Town are not thrilled about all these Joburg people who have come there. So I also wanted to just uh, let you know that the Joburg people are still on your side, Shelley. And for the people of Cape Town, you've got to be thrilled that these uh, Joburg people are coming because they're actually adding value to your crappy economy. So just be grateful. How about that? The relief that they're arriving is huge. My advice to all of them is think twice before you come. And I want to tell you what is happening is as the Joburg people come in, the Cape Townians are moving out, boy. They're trying to get away from us. They Where are, are they heading going? for Paul, Paul, uh, Somerset West, Stellenbosch, Franschhoek. They are heading to outlying areas because we are, we are cramping their style. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't realize that. So there's semigration and then there's semi semigration. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Jeez. Exactly. Fascinating exactly. stuff. All right. Well, listen, it's lovely to see you again. Uh, I haven't seen you uh, since this, uh, since uh, I don't know what, four, four, five years ago was the last time I saw you. So it's nice to see you again and keep uh, flying the Gauteng flag down there. And, and I hope that your dogs don't bite any homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Gareth, it's great to see you, and I'll see you next time I'm in Joburg. Awesome. Thanks, Shelley. Nice to see you. Cheers. There's Shelley Bennett keeping us company this morning. Lots of cool stuff to talk about and think about there. And we will be back tomorrow at 6 a.m. for another Tuesday edition of the show. Leanne, enjoy your new glasses. You're actually going to be able to see around uh, town today. You'll be able to realize where the hell you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm scared of what I'll see, so I'll, I'll, I'll be careful. <laughs> you actually... For people who don't know, Leanne actually thought she was in Cape Town for the last uh, couple of years. <laughs> not so bad. She actually thought she was in Cape Town. She thought that that haze on the on the horizon was the sea, but it wasn't. It was just the smog. <laughs> oh, very yes, tough. indeed. All right. Very good. Thank you, everybody. We will see you tomorrow at 6 a.m. Have an awesome day. Cheers. Bye-bye.